Hello fellows, Mr. Creepy Creeps here. If you are new here, you can subscribe our channel. We upload daily horror videos. A wise man once said, if you want to understand an artist, look at his art. Common people who don't deal with murder and torture on a daily basis may not realize that the same applies to serial killers. Sherlock Holmes said, Singularity is almost invariably a clue. The more featureless and commonplace a crime is, the more difficult is it to bring it home. The more mundane a crime is, the harder it is to understand the mind of the criminal. Someone who wears a ski mask and mugs a random person on the street cannot easily be profiled. They could be any random drug addict, homeless person, gang member, or even just a nearby neighbor in a bad section of the city. There are millions of potential suspects across the U.S. who could commit such a crime. But someone who kidnaps women on the full moon, hangs their intestines on the branches in a forest, and mails their bloody eyes to a news channel, leaves behind a lot of clues. The more outrageous and unique the behavior of the killer, the more our profiling techniques allow us to understand about his feelings, his upbringing, his mindset, and, eventually, his identity. Usually, anyway, but not this time. This time, the man I was hunting, who the media called the Frost Hollow Ripper, would not fit any normal profiling description or psychiatric prediction that the best minds at the FBI had created over decades. By the end of the case, I wasn't even sure if what I was hunting was human at all. My partner and I drove through the bloody glow of the sunset deeper into the forest, heading to the crime scene. It was the third crime scene we had been to for this unsub or unknown subject, the Frost Hollow Ripper. The GPS took us down dirt roads cratered with potholes and covered in sharp stones that crunched under the tires. This is really bumfuck middle of nowhere country, huh? My partner, Agent Stone said as he swerved around yet another pothole. I nearly felt carsick from all the steep hills and curving back roads we had taken. Up ahead, I saw the bright red and blue strobing of police lights, though their sirens were off. They had secured the crime scene after a hunter had found the body and called it in. Their orders were to keep everyone out until crime scene technicians from the FBI could examine the scene and collect evidence. I haven't seen a house in at least 20 minutes, I said, agreeing. We pulled up on the narrow dirt road behind the first of the police cars. Strangely enough, though, I saw no police anywhere. Yellow crime scene tape was haphazardly strewn across trees and bushes, but it looked like someone had given up halfway through the task. Jesus Christ! These rural hick cops can't do shit right, Agent Stone said in Greeley, shaking his head. Where is everyone? They're supposed to be securing the crime scene, not go off in the bushes to circle jerk. Something didn't feel right about it to me, though. I scanned the black shadows and looming pine trees towering over us on all sides, but nothing moved anywhere. Agent Stone shut off the car and I realized something else eerie. There wasn't a single sound coming from anywhere around us, other than the slight ticking and pinging of the cooling engine. It was as silent as a graveyard out there. Even the wind seemed to have stopped, as if the world held its breath and waited. This doesn't feel right, I said, feeling weak and anxious. My heart seemed to be beating too fast in my chest. I wanted to get out of there. Something's wrong here. Can't you feel it? Agent Stone cocked his head at me. You feeling all right, buddy? He asked. I shook my head. There's no sounds outside, no crickets, no bugs chirping at all. It's eerie. And where is everyone? I said. He gave me a crooked grin and pushed his door open. That's what we're going to find out right now, he said excitedly, keeping his hand on his forty-five pistol. He still had his normal swagger and bravado. I took my pistol out of the holster, swearing under my breath as I followed him outside into the thick forest and flashing glare of the police lights. Well, there she is, 
Agent Stone said, shaking his head grimly. He pointed with a thick finger at the corpse strewn over the leaves like garbage. His colorless gray eyes flashed with anger. I looked closely at the victim, wondering how this one had fallen into the trap of another psychopath. Like lions, psychopaths have an instinctual understanding of who in the herd is the weakest. They can pick up vulnerabilities. I believe that if you took the brainwaves of a lion stalking a herd and a psychopath stalking a victim, you would find similar results. Holy shit, I whispered as I saw the extent of the injuries. Her ribs stuck up from her chest like curving spikes rising into the air. Her eyes were gone, the black sockets seeming to radiate an expression of complete surprise and horror. Her face showed signs of mutilation. A Glasgow smile sliced across her cheeks, the bloody lines curving up to her ears to give a false impression of intense excitement. Her fingernails and toenails were all removed, the bloody, gaping flesh looking raw and red. In the tree next to her, I saw those same dismembered nails embedded deeply in its bark. I nudged Agent Stone, pointing to it. What in the hell? He said. How is that even possible? I just shook my head. Before today, I would have said it was not. Did you notice her heart is missing too? I looked closer, realizing he was right. A deep, gore-strewn crater lay where her heart used to sit in her open chest. Before I could say anything, though, a raspy, gurgling breathing came from the nearby bushes. In the eerie silence of the night, the noise rang out like a gunshot. Agent Stone and I froze, staring in amazement and horror at the brush as a police officer came crawling out. He dragged himself forwards like a possum with a broken spine. His legs were bent backwards like the legs of an ostrich. Sharp bone fragments pierced outwards through his skin, leaving angry red tears in the flesh that slowly dripped blood down his pale skin. Like the woman, his eyes were removed. Now only gaping holies remained. Is someone there? The police officer whispered in a hoarse voice, coughing up a mouthful of blood. God, help me. It was here. I saw it. It took... Shay. What was here? Agent Stone asked frantically, kneeling down before the man. What did you see? But in response, the police officer's head fell forward, his arms and legs twitching as he seized and danced. With a chattering of teeth and a ragged death gasp, he fell still. His mutilated face slowly descended to the carpet of leaves on the forest floor. And we... I looked back at the police cars, counting three of them. If my guess was correct, then there were up to five more officers still missing or lost. I didn't know what kind of chaotic bloodshed had happened here, but I didn't have much hope that any of them were alive. Agent Stone had taken out his radio. Frantically, he began whispering into it, glancing around with panicked eyes at the shadows that pressed in on us from all sides. This is Agent Stone, he called into it. We have officers down, state police officers, not feds. He waited for a long time. We need backup immediately at the crime scene off of Turtleback Lane. Over. A hissing like many snakes exploded through the speaker. Behind the white noise, I could hear faint words, raspy and barely audible. There were other sounds in there too. Explosions, the shrieking of metal, a circus calliope, the theme song from Looney Tunes and gunshots. Then it descended into laughter, and the radio slowly failed in Agent Stone's hand, the lights fading out and the sound dying to nothing. What the hell, this is almost brand new, Agent Stone said, shaking the radio. He began to try to check the back and remove the battery cover, but I grabbed his shoulder as I saw a glint of rusted metal off a nearby giant rock only twenty feet or so from the bodies. What is that? I asked in a low voice. Are you seeing this? Agent Stone blinked rapidly shining his flashlight on it. The rock itself stood ten feet tall, a jagged piece of sharp stone whose blade pierced upwards towards the sky. 
I saw a square of ancient metal with a spinning handle like a submarine door might have in the bottom. It was more than large enough for a full-grown man to move through. Some joker probably put it there, he said, putting on a pair of latex gloves. Or the killer did, I said. Slowly we descended forward and looked at the strange door. Do you think this could be some sort of weird hermit safe? He asked, looking up at me with excitement. Maybe the killer used it. Maybe he built it. I shrugged, not knowing what to say. Well, only one way to find out. Excitedly, he moved forward and wrapped his gloved hands around the handle. Wait, I'm not sure, I began to say, but my words were cut off by the low whining of rusted metal as he spun the wheel. Jesus, it's stiff as all hell, he groaned, his large muscles bulging. Small beads of perspiration popped out on his pale forehead as he continued struggling with the rusted wheel. After a few turns, the mechanism unlatched with a click. The trapdoor began to pop open on its own with a whirring of gears. At the same time, a cacophonous wail like a tornado siren started all around us. It sounded like the trees themselves were screaming in low descending waves. I covered my ears, trying to scream something to Agent Stone, but I couldn't hear my own voice over the screaming of the siren. Then the door finished opening, the siren cut off in mid-note. Agent Stone and I looked down at the trap door, now completely spooked. I continuously checked my back, looking for any movement. I also looked for hidden speakers in the trees, but I couldn't see any. Holy shit, Agent Stone said, which encapsulated my thoughts exactly. Through the rock wall, we saw a hallway covered in peeling yellow wallpaper and flickering fluorescent lights. A smell like blood and vomit blew out of it in a soft, fetid breeze. The humming of the lights overhead was turned up to max volume. It felt like a clamp pressed over my forehead just listening to them. We stood motionless for a very long moment, just staring into this impossible scene. Agent Stone turned to me, his eyes wide, his face as white as chalk. Am I dreaming right now? He asked. Or did someone drug us? Are you seeing what I'm seeing right now? I nodded, starting to say something when a ragged scream full of agony and terror tore its way across the tunnel. I jumped my finger tightening around the trigger as I instinctively raised my gun, but nothing was there. I took out my radio trying to call for backup, but it was totally dead, just a hunk of useless plastic and metal in my hand. Is that blood? I said, pointing to the hallway. It had cracked wooden floors with large black holes eaten into them. The holes seemed to go down forever, as if beneath the floor existed an endless abyss of shadows. Swerving around the holes, I saw twin streaks of blood sweeping the ground, as if someone injured or dying had been dragged away. A gunshot rang out from deep in the hallway. The terrified screaming started again. Abruptly it cut off. There was a faint sound of gurgling and bubbling, then silence. Agent Stone shook his head, then began walking forward into the tunnel. Watch my back, Harper, he said. I think we may have an officer down somewhere in there. We passed through the trap door, avoiding the craters eaten into the floor as if by a corrosive acid. The endless drop beneath my feet where these holes existed caused my stomach to twist with vertigo. The blood trail swirled around the craters with precision, doors lined both sides of the hallway. They looked like hospital room doors, a dingy gray color with small observation windows built into the top of each one. There's people in there, Agent Stone said with a note of amazement. I quickly glanced through the observation window he was staring at. I saw a cell with smooth gray concrete forming an oppressive box. In the corner, the dead body of a young girl lay, her eyes torn out, her chest ripped open. Next to the body, I saw... something. It was nearly as tall as the ceiling. Its body was impossibly thin and its limbs long and twisted. Its glossy black skin flashed as it turned, looking straight at me through the window. Its eyes were like pale, milky cataracts, 
totally faded to a disgusting off-white, its head tapered to a point. Its mouth was like a deep, infected slash from a knife. It ran at the door with a gurgling wailing, almost like the crying of a terrified infant. The door shuttered its frame as its black body filled the window and smashed into it, but thankfully, the door held. Ahead of us, a creaking sound traveled down the hallway as faint as a whisper. And yet, this subtle, small thing terrified me just as much as the creature I had just seen. Agent Stone continued moving forward with single-minded determination, his face fixed and grim. He looked ready for death, and here he would find it. A decapitated human head flew out the open doorway ten feet in front of us, smashing against the sickly yellowing wallpaper with a cracking of bones and an explosion of bones and hair. A moment later, the rest of the body followed, still clad in a police officer uniform. The body soared through the air, hit the wall, and then fell through one of the craters in the floor, slipping slowly away over the ledge. It instantly disappeared from view in the abyssal shadows that ate the light like a hungry mouth. The wailing of an insane, hurt infant came from in front of us as another one of those things slithered out of the door. Its face ratcheted towards us, its pale eyes the color of dying moonlight staring straight through me. Then it charged. Stop! Agent Stone cried, raising his pistol and firing as the thing's pointed reptilian skull. I froze for a long moment, until gunshots shattered the air. I jumped into action, bringing my pistol up and joining Agent Stone in trying to bring down this abomination. Its fingers looked as sharp as knives, its body loped forward in a slithering, inhuman way, its legs twisting with extra joints, its long, narrow arms held out to the sides of its body in a kind of writhing peristalsis. The first of Agent Stone's bullets smashed into its left hand. Something like oil exploded from its alien flesh. The black liquid shone with opalescent rainbow colors as it spattered the walls. The creature's wailing intensified, seeming to shake the very ground. One of mine hit it in the narrow torso of the creature, a torso that rose up like a thin tree. More of the black blood ran out in a waterfall, leaving a trail of oily slime that mixed with the fresh blood of the police officer. I backpedaled quickly, emptying my magazine. Agent Stone turned to run as his pistol clicked empty. I spun, seeing that I had nearly fallen into one of the enormous craters eaten into the fabric of this eldritch hallway. We started sprinting our way back toward the door, which seemed like no more than a dark pinprick far off in the distance. Every time I glanced back, the creature had gotten closer. Agent Stone was only a step behind me. We reloaded as we ran, throwing the empty magazines behind us like garbage and slamming fresh ones in. But before Agent Stone ever got a chance to use it, he was flung forward. Fat drops of fresh blood spiraled from a deep hole in his back. I looked back, seeing the creature only a few feet behind me, its scalpel-like fingers covered in blood, its sore of a mouth splitting into a sick grin. I watched in horror as Agent Stone's broken body flew through the air in a slow, lazy arc. Still kicking and punching, he disappeared through one of the craters in the floor. His screams echoed through the air, full of an insane animal panic and an incomprehensible horror. Abruptly, they cut off, and Agent Stone disappeared from view forever. The thing followed me as I neared the door, so close I could smell its breath, a sickly, infected smell like septic shock. Staggering out into the cool autumn air, I turned, ready to fight. It ran at me through the threshold, still wailing, still grinning. Its wounds continued to drip in thick, clotted rivers down its alien flesh. I raised my pistol as its knife-like fingers came down. I felt a burning pain in my right ear as it got cut off, and then a searing agony in my shoulder. The sound of crunching bone and the wet sound of flesh separating filled my ears. But as it attacked, so did I, firing at its blind, milky eyes. Its face exploded with the impact of the bullets, a crater the size of an orange forming above its mouth. 
As warm blood ran down my body and shock took over, the creature stumbled back and then fell. I fell back at the same time, collapsing to the ground and screaming. The pain hit me all at once like a freight train smashing into my body. I rolled on the ground, clutching my ear and shattered shoulder. Before the creature fell, though, I caught a glimpse of something metal around its neck. It looked like a silver cross. At the time, injured and terrified, I thought nothing of it. Injured and hyperventilating, I crawled back to the car, hoping against hope that the car radio would at least work. And to my surprise, it did. There were no more hissing or faint voices behind the mist of white noise as I called for help. Agents quickly arrived, but they weren't from the FBI. They took the body of the creature away and examined the door as EMTs moved me into the back of an ambulance. A couple days later, my supervisor called me into his office and told me some disturbing news. The creature I had killed was actually a person, a man who had gone missing six months earlier. He had disappeared from his house in the middle of the night, surrounded by family members and street cameras. The case had been a complete mystery. The pathologist said the man had a strange mutated species of bacteria in his blood that had slowly hardened and transformed his features and caused massive changes in his brain. When they had taken his brain out of that pointed alien skull, it had been black, covered in a spider webbing of some sticky, mold-like substance. I can only hope I wasn't in there long enough to get a dose of whatever changed that man into a monster. Soon after, I got a visit from certain unknown agents from a secret alphabet agency who asked me about my experience in the Badlands, as they called it. They hung on my every word. We'd like you to take us back in there, one of them said, his dark eyes serious and grim. We have a team that will accompany you and protective suits, of course, but I just shook my head. Do you know what's in your blood right now? The other asked his expression turning sadistic. A mutated form of spirilla is twisting through your system as we speak. Our agency has the only known antibiotic capable of killing off this bacteria in its early stages. He appeared disinterested, turning away. But of course, if you don't want to help us... This is blackmail, I said, disgusted. But they had the power... And before I knew it, fate would return me to that hellish place, the hidden hallways of the Badlands.